Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. My guest today is chef, author, and restaurateur, Jamie Bissonnette. If you want to discover the chef and the man behind Copa in Boston, Toro in Boston, New York, and Dubai, and Little Donkey, both in Cambridge and Bangkok, Thailand, stay tuned. I am your host, Emmanuel LaRoche. Welcome to another episode of Flavors Unknown podcast. Thank you for listening today. If you are new to the show, I have been in the food industry for more than 20 years, both in Europe and in the US. And every other week, I interview trending chef, pastry chef, and bartenders to learn about their creative process, share with you great food locations, and find out which new flavors they are experimenting with. Last week, my guest was the executive pastry chef, Mark Welker, from Eleven Madison Park. The podcast website is flavorsunknown.com, where you can find all the show notes from all the episodes of the show. If you are on Instagram or Facebook, you can follow us at Flavors Unknown. Let's bring chef Jamie Bissonnette on the show now. Good morning, chef. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm very good. I'm really excited to have you on uh, the show Flavors Unknown. I'm stoked to be on it. <laughs> Thank you. So I've read that you just came back from a trip from Spain. And before that, you went to uh, Dubai. Uh, you know, several weeks before, you know, your trip to Spain. So I, I'm curious, have you discovered anything interesting during those trips? So it could be new locations, could be new ingredients, new flavors and dishes, anything that like really interesting to you and say like, hmm, that's different. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, my partner Ken and I, when we travel, we, uh, we like to leave no stone unturned. We go down every alley, we go into every store, whether it's just a a corner, you know, Fruit and Seco's place in San Sebastian or, you know, a corner bodega in Dubai, and we look at everything. So it's been great to find, you know, new new ingredients, new restaurants, and we get inspired from everything that we see. So, I mean, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, I don't know anything that, uh, you know, really impacted you, something that, that was like different from previous trips that you have taken there? Yeah, we went to this one market. And in the market, there was a restaurant called Casa Danny. Opened up very early in the morning. Uh, before where the was market. it? Where was it? Sorry. Where, where, it's in, in Madrid. which country? In, it's in, in Madrid. Madrid. Okay. Yeah. Madrid. Okay. Northwest in the city. So we, we went out there and we were told that they had one of the best tortilla española. And it was pretty remarkable. And the way that they made it, they said they wouldn't tell us, but their kitchen had a window. So. We posted <laughs> up and watched them make the tortilla, and we came back and promptly changed the tortilla at Toro to mimic a similar cooking style. Theirs was cooked for a short amount of time. It had not as much of a crust on the outside and not as dark. It was a little bit more blonde, and the the potatoes and the onions were chunkier, but cooked and added into the eggs hot, and it was served a little bit runny, and it was just fantastic. Fantastic. Any other specific ingredients that they've added, or it's more in the way no, of cooking it? it was just, it was really just in the way that they cooked it, but they did have a caracoles dish, a, a, a snail dish that they used a very specific kind of paprika that the, the owner of the place said he got from his uncle. And it was so unbelievably smoky. We tried to buy some from him, but he said no. <laughs> okay. And anything from the, the trip to Dubai? Oh, that, came that, that was the interesting. Yeah, yeah. We came back from the trip in Dubai with, the, you know, a myriad of new spice blends from the souk. There's a couple of people in the souk that, uh, that are from, uh, from Iraq and Iran, and they specialize in wild, high altitude mountain honey. I love honey. I think honey is such a dynamic ingredient. And the honey they have is unlike anything I've ever tasted before. It, it tastes more like a, I guess, like a fruit molasses and less like typical honey. It's got a great acidity. And it's just wildly different than anything else. Was it coming from a specific, uh, you know, flower plant and so on? Was it a, like a mix? It's a mix because it, it comes from wild honey, wild hives. A, it's extremely dangerous to, to harvest it. B, 
because the bees are not used to humans and, and B, it's very sought after. So it's like three times as expensive as any of the other honeys that we could get at, from these same people. But this one particular style is, it's just remarkable and they come from different parts of the, the mountain ranges. So each different one has its own terroir and its own completely different flavor. So we, I brought back a bunch of those that we've been playing around with and uh, smuggled back some really, really amazing Cecina that we bought at a market in uh, in Madrid as well, that dry-aged ham made from like smoked beef. That was great. I don't think I had that be- before. That's something, um, you know, that would be new to me. Okay, cool. So obviously you have been in a lot of places around the planet and then you, I'm guessing, identifying like interesting new things. Do you have a process to discover interesting like location during your travels? You know, th- yeah, the process is pretty hard. It's Wake up in the morning, put on comfortable <laughs> shoes, and yes. don't come back until I'm exhausted. And yeah. just look at everything. I mean, I'll go into a coffee, like a coffee shop chain that we have in the United States, just to see how the menu differs and see if they have like different pastries. I don't always order one, but I'll go in and look. And you know, I just go in every market that I walk by. I stop in, and if I see something that I haven't seen at the previous market, I try it. And you know. I would say that my success rate is very low for that kind of stuff. But when I do find that one new ingredient, that one new market, that one new dish that I, that I get to try, it makes it all worth it. So you are not like scouting the, the location, the place and so on, or making like contact with, uh, you know, people upon your, your, your trip that you have taken? Well, sometimes we do. Yeah, for sure. You know, we do, Ken and I will do a lot of research. We'll reach out to chefs that we know in areas and ask them, if they'll take us around, we'll reach out to makers and say, hey, we're coming. Can we come do a tour of your facility? For sure. But to be honest, all of that's great. But my favorite way is still to just go somewhere for a week and walk around until I, until I get to know it as it's my own. How do you um, apply this new discovery and um, how do you make it your own? Well, it, it all depends. Sometimes it's the beauty of simplicity. I, I find that when we bring our staff with us on these trips, uh, specifically to Spain. Uh, one of the things that we, you know, Spain is such an innovative culinary capital of the world, but it also, it excels in its simplicity. You know, and a lot of times young cooks, when they don't understand intrinsically that culture of, of food, they think that they need to have too many ingredients to make something more interesting. And then when you're in Spain and you realize that a Cantabrian anchovy with olive oil doesn't really need anything but a vehicle to put it on your mouth whether it's a fork or a piece of bread. So bringing some of those, like stripping down some of the overcomplicated things that we do at the restaurant so we can focus on simplicity is one thing that's great. Another thing is just coming back and being collaborative and saying, oh, what did they do? How how can we do that? How can we do that with ingredients that are local? How can we do that and make it our own? What, What would we do to make that more interesting? I always say, don't cook the recipe like, you know, like you have to follow it exactly. And I think you've heard me say this before. It's like music. You know, the first time you want to play somebody else's song, you follow the sheet music and you figure it out. And then when you want to make that song your own, you don't say, hey, I wrote this song. But you say, hey, this is my version of All Along the Watchtower by Bob Dylan. Or this is my version (laughs) of, you know, Take Five by Dave Brubeck Quartet with Paul Desmond. And you get to take an idea, make it your own and still give credit to the originators. And I think that we do a very good job of doing that. There is, um, I don't know if, you know, it's coming from you or if it's coming from, uh, you know, Chef Ken Oringer, but the, uh, there's one item on the menu in Toro in New York City that I cannot miss every time I go there. It's the uni um, bocadillo and uh, that, you know, yeah, there's on the menu. So what was the, the sheet music, you know, behind this one? I think it's like outstanding. It's indulgent. It's uh, it, yeah, <laughs> it's like a, it's so, like, a, it's like a really awesome seafood grilled cheese without cheese. So Ken and I were talking years ago in Boston before Toro New York opened, and we were talking about another sea urchin preparation. And you know, a lot of people do sea urchin toasts, which we love. We have been doing them for a while. And uh, he said, you know, what about doing something like you know, like pressed like a panino or like a bocadillo, so it's crispy. And we like went back and forth. Like every culture that serves sea urchin, for the most part has a dish where sea urchin is served with something that's kind of buttery or rich, kind of acidic and some sort of spice to it. Whether it's sea urchin on seasoned, you know, seasoned sushi rice like a nigiri 
or if it's you know somewhere where they just put it on toast with butter and lemon. Uh, so we said, all right, well, let's take, let's start with that. And we started just kind of putting things together and we said, okay, well, let's do the butter, but let's take to make the butter a little bit more umami. So we added miso. And then, uh, so, okay. Okay, let's add some, let's add something that makes it a little bit more fresh. And we both love chives, but we realized that the chives didn't stand up to it. So we tried it with scallions and I can still picture us the first time we made it because we made it on the line and all of the ingredients for what we were going to put into it were already made for other dishes. And we just put them together a la minute, put it on the piece of bread, and then covered the outside of the bread with mayonnaise to make sure it would get crispy, and then griddled it. And when we took a bite, we were like, wow, it was amazing. So, you know, we decided, well, you know, maybe we could put a little bit of mustard in it, but we thought mustard was too strong. So we used pickled mustard seeds and we found, uh, we finally found it. That's amazing. <laughs> so for everyone who is listening that haven't been to Toro yet or never, you know, ordered the uni bocadillo, you should. That's a must. <laughs> That's a must. So let's talk a little bit about the, the three concepts that you have. Copa in Boston, you have, uh, you know, Toro in different locations, and then uh, Little Donkey in Boston as well. Can you tell us a little bit of the type of food that, uh, you know, that you serve in those places and the difference between like the three concepts? Sure. So Toro is inspired by Spain. When people say, oh, is it a Spanish tapas restaurant? We say kind of. It's not based off of one specific region. We kind of took like the all-star hits of the, some of the foods that we've loved from all of our travels. And the thing that I love about Spanish culture is because it's so innovative, you can really mix any kind of flavors together and you can still have that same spirit of, you know, eat a little bit often with delicious, impactful bites like tapas and pinchos. Copa is an Italian enoteca, very small. Uh, the whole restaurant's smaller than most people's apartments in the city. So under 800, about 800 square feet. We see just under 30 people plus a patio in the summer. And we do handmade pastas, house-made charcuterie, and a wood-burning pizza oven. We stay pretty true to Italian roots. And again, it's not like we're we're saying that we're we do all Amalfi Coast, you know, food, or we do all Bologna or Venice or, you know, any one, one city or region. We kind of uh, you know, like to put the flavors together, thinking like, okay, if you were an Italian grandmother or grandfather and you came to the United States and these are the local ingredients you had, how would you put them together in that same spirit? And then Little Donkey. Uh, Little Donkey, we have one in Cambridge and we have one in Bangkok. And Little Donkey is modeled after the, the best way to say it is if you came over to my apartment and or Ken's apartment or we came over, you know, and we were all hanging out together and said, okay, let's have some food. And we opened up our fridge because we both cook so much at home. You know, we might pull out a couple oysters and maybe slice some raw fish. If we had caviar for some reason, we, you know, we could put it on like, you know, make a bread and butter sandwich with caviar. And then I might say, hey, you know, I made chicken tikka masala the other day. So we're going to have uh, chicken tikka masala on, sto on top of steamed Korean rice because I have some, you know, I have some steamed Korean whole grain rice and, you know, Ken might be like, oh, you know what? I want to make a pizza bagel. And then I'm like, oh yeah, let's, you know, I live in Chinatown, Boston. So I always have Chinese, you know, fresh Chinese noodles really accessible. So I might say, oh, I'm going to make some chow food. And, you know, then all of a sudden we've had this meal that kind of went all over the place, but it worked because it was all food that we loved and we liked to cook. So for this one, it seems to be that there's less structured or, you know, it seems to be more a kind of a freedom, you know, um, approach yeah. to, uh, to food. And how often do you, do you change the, the menu then? Because I'm sure that with the two of you cooking, you know, and creating and researching all the time, you said, oh, that's probably like a new, a new idea for Little Donkey. So, <laughs> yeah, it's easy. Like we can walk into Little Donkey and on the way, stop at the Indian market and see pour, some Panpuri grab it and then be like, oh, hey guys, today we're going to change the sea urchin to be sea urchin penpuri. And, and nobody really bats an eye. So we can change little things every day. We can change other things a lot more often if we want to. And we're actually moving forward to make Little Donkey 99.9% .9 gluten-free. That's one thing that you and Ken are always, you know, in the move and creating and so on. But how do you motivate your team to, uh, you know, to follow and implement, you know, um, all the ideas that you're having? Infectious passion. You know, we're both like we're both like little kids when we start talking about food. So as long as we can get the business stuff out of the way in the morning, by the afternoon, all we want to do is taste food and eat food and, and make people happy. 
And that dope that you know, when you make when you make a new dish or you make a dish for somebody that they've never had before and they like it, that dopamine rush that that a chef can get from that is so addictive. So we kind of go into that mode and we just want to make things that people go, wow, this is delicious. So how is your partnership with uh, Chef uh, Ken Oringer? So Oringer, so how do you work together? We work together really well. When I call him, if his, if his wife answers the phone, he'll say, hey, Ken, it's your girlfriend. <laughs> Or boyfriend, depending upon what mood she's in. She calls me both. Uh, and that's fine. I don't, I don't identify with you. How long do you know each other? Yeah. We've known each other for about 20 years. We've been friendly for about 20 years. We've worked together for over 10, obviously. And I've known of him for even before that. He's my mentor and he's my, one of my best friends. And he's like, a, he's like the older brother I never wanted. Okay. <laughs> so what are your respective roles in the, in the restaurant? So together, we, uh, we kind of do it all. We run, the, we run the business portion. We run the food portion. We help the managers. We cultivate the teams and we collaborate. You know, we, uh, our, our catchphrase is whenever we see each other is, hey, want to catch up? And catch up might be him t telling me about what's going on with his kids and the latest play that Verven was in or about travel that he's planning with, with Celine and his wife. Or it could be talking about a new fee that we're going to implement on a check, or it could be about a new, op a new opportunity that we have or a renegotiating our lease with the landlord. It could be about a new dish. Sometimes I'll show up at one of the restaurants where I know that him and I are going to meet with a cookbook that I know he hasn't seen. And then we like read the cookbook and talk about that together. And then you are always, um, you know, traveling together when you are going abroad, like, like when you went to Spain or like Dubai. And No, we both travel a, a fair amount independently. I do have to say like, For a long time, we traveled, you know, once or twice a year together, but we would both travel independently more. We have so much more fun when we're together because we both just want to be like, oh, look at this. Oh, look, at we're like, we're like children. And I don't think a lot of other people can keep up with us. Like my fiance certainly will run out of steam and Ken's family will run out of steam before he and I'm I sure. will. So it's good that we have each other because we're kind of like puppies where, you know, you just let us go together and we tire each other out. So you have Toro, correct, in, in Boston, in uh, New York, and in Dubai. Correct. And then yeah. Lincoln Donkey, you know, you have it as well at, uh, you know, at two locations. So curious is, if you take Toro, for instance, so how, what's the, the major challenge then it, you faced when you were taking Toro from Boston to New York City? And because, you know, is it like different, you know, culture, different type of customers between, you know, Boston and New York? Yeah, yeah, it's very. It was a unique, uh, a unique experiment in the beginning, for sure. Good food is good food universally, but in New York, there was a, a lot more of a pull to make it eat like more easier to handle. People wanted a little bit more posh to it, and it's it's ironic. Like we could find the same guest will come to Toro Boston, sit at a higher table, eat corn on the cob, drink wine out of a out of a low glass. And then th that same guest will be in New York at the same restaurant and say they want their corn cut off the cob. They don't want to sit at a high table and that they want their, or they want their wine in a fancy stemmed glass, even though they're at the same restaurant for the same experience, perceivably. And they're just in two different cities and they're the same person. And it's, it's just unique to see how, you know, New York gives people a different kind of a, a kind of a different joy to vive, a different excitement for life which I had never noticed because I'd never had that controlled environment to see the comparison. So there was a little bit of challenges with that, realizing that we could do the same thing in two different cities, but we might have to tweak them either aesthetically or mechanically to make them uh, more appropriate for, for New York. So how does it work practically is at the beginning when you open uh, New York City, did you start with the, like, the same menu that you had and then you, the, that menu evolved based on, you know, customers' feedback? Yeah, I mean, Ken and I, we were so excited for New York and for the fact that the kitchen was going to be bigger. We would have a couple more cooks. We would have more equipment. So we knew that we could make the menu bigger. And then when we got down there, some of the importers of some of the specialty ingredients that are based in New York had more accessibility than the things that we could get here. There was different seafood available, the, the farmer's market there. Sorry, Boston, but the farmer's market in New York is way better than the farmer's market in Boston. And we found ourselves going there a lot. And uh, a menu that was pretty much the same as Boston with a couple of new additions 
And by the time we went through training and opened, it was probably only about 15% the same menu to Boston. So what are like the signature dish that you have uh, in New York that are different from the one in Boston? Uh, the signature dishes are probably the same. Like our paella doesn't change, the patatas bravas, the pan con tomate, those things, you know, the they, octopus. those things don't change. Yeah. I'm guessing Dubai is a different beast. So how, how did you approach that when you transferred the concept Toro to, uh, to Dubai? So for Dubai, we, uh, we had a, we, luckily we had our opening chef there, Oscar, is one of the most talented, passionate from Spain, but he had lived in Dubai for seven years and worked in Spanish restaurants. So he had a really good idea of what would work and wouldn't work. Uh, even when we, we didn't listen to him, he ended up being right probably like 60% of the time. So that was very helpful. You know, one of the things was we don't have a pork license there, so we have no ham, which is, you know, as you know, that's like the life's blood in Spain. I've been in Spain with vegetarians. We're like, oh, I'm sorry, this person's a vegetarian, and the bartender will bring over ham. And I'm like, oh, no, they're vegetarian. They go, yeah, but it's just ham. It's just ham. <laughs> you like, you realize, oh, you can be a vegetarian in Spain, but still eat habugo. That's great. <laughs> And that actually is what de developed us into doing um, some more like charcuterie with duck and you getting and sourcing some salamis from Lyon, Spain that were made from all beef and Wagyu. So we've got some great, some great Wagyu cecina and some, uh, some grass fed beef uh, chorizo and saucisson. Okay. I like the way how you say saucisson. It's pretty good. <laughs> 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 so and and for little donkey so the this is is it easier because the fact of how the menu is structured and then it's like almost like a, a patchwork of like different thoughts so when you went to uh, bangkok so it was like almost easier like to translate it yeah uh, bangkok was a little bit more difficult because the culture of eating in thailand is very specific so if in if, what way if when thais you don't if thais don't relate to how a restaurant is, they don't understand it, they won't go into it. Or they'll go into it and just order what they recognize. Even if they don't know what the dish is, they, they want to recognize a couple ingredients or, a, a, or the style. So even though it's pretty much the same restaurant as, Toro, as Little Donkey in, in uh, Cambridge, Mass, we still called it, just for the local market, a global izakaya. So they understood, okay. oh, okay, izakaya, so we're eating small plates because we had Toro in, in Bangkok for, for two and a half years, and that, it was okay, but people didn't get it. They didn't understand, they didn't understand it, and the, there wasn't enough texture in some of the traditional Spanish foods, and there wasn't enough spice. So, you know, after, after two and a half years, we decided to revamp it and turn it into a little donkey, which has been great. And the people, are, the, the, people the guests that we get um, are mostly a couple of expats here and there, but they're mostly local Thai. And in order to really appeal to that crowd, we needed to have things that, you know, there were things that they were familiar enough with to be, to get excited about, but weren't something that they would make at home or get, you know, at a street stall or another restaurant because you can't compete with nostalgia. If you, you know, if we put in a lob, a larb dish there that somebody's like, oh, my grandmother made larb, they're never going to like it. Never, ever, ever, ever. It's like, it's like trying to convince somebody from New Jersey that you make a better gabagool than their grandmother. It's like, no way. They're never going to believe you. So what are like the different, uh, I would say, like foreign influence did you use in the, in the menu in Bangkok? Well, the cool thing about Bangkok is it's already such a melting pot of a city. You know, there's been a Muslim area for, you know, a hundred years. So there's already places where you're getting a mashup of a Pakistani style dal that's seasoned with some Thai ingredients, fish sauce and Thai bird chilies. So that kind of like that kind of melting pot cuisine has been around. So for us to do that made a lot of sense. So we just wanted to make sure that we, we touch on cultures that are familiar to the Thai palate and Thai people. But how do you blend uh, these influence together on a dish or on a menu, still like while keeping like the authenticity of the ingredients or, you know, the authenticity of the techniques with, without creating like a, a fusion mess, I would call it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's a fine line between a fusion, between what people call fusion and a fusion mess because all food is kind of fusion. Pizza was a fusion of, of a bunch of ingredients that were left over by the moors and the ovens. And it, there was somebody saying, hey, let's make pita, but instead of putting stuff inside it, let's put it on top and we'll call it pizza instead. You know, so I think that 
you know, what we make sure is that we, we take, if we're going to do something based off of something that needs to be traditionally thought of or authentic, that we say, okay, we're going to, we're going to know how to do this authentically. Like, so when we do anything with sticky rice in Bangkok, we do it the traditional way in a bamboo basket over boiling water with a cloth on top. We always make the rice the proper way. What we do with it afterwards might not be traditional, might not be authentic to anything, but because the techniques were there and the thought is there and, you know, it's, it's like anything, you know, we know what and how we're going to do something, but knowing why we're doing it makes it is what makes it authentic. So like we, one of the dishes we made, we were walking through the markets in Chinatown, Bangkok, and we saw somebody making fresh Yuba tofu skin. So we bought that tofu skin, we brought it back to the restaurant, we cut it out, and we decided to use that as our pasta to make a lasagna. So there's no, I don't think any traditional tofu skin lasagna anywhere in the world, but we did it anyway. And we did lasagna with ricotta and mozzarella, and then we did like a, a really spicy larb type beef that almost looked like bolognese, but had a lot more of the northern um, northern Thai spices in it to give it like some umami and some like numbingness and we baked it and it looked like lasagna it had a sensory memory of lasagna but if i put that in front of somebody who had never traveled outside of their own little neighborhood in like you know the north end of boston or somewhere in jersey or little italy you know who was not adventurous with other foods they would eat that and go what the heck is this and that was that's the cool thing about being a chef is that you don't have to be traditional and authentic all the time. You can be innovative. You can, you can, you know, use your own whimsy, but as long as you, you do it in a way that's educated, you're not just throwing things together. I'm not a big fan when somebody says that they take, oh, I'm just going to take kimchi and I'm going to put kimchi in my bolognese pasta for no reason. And you say, you eat it and you're like, okay, this tastes like an Italian pasta dish with really nice noodles and then a sour pickled fermented spicy cabbage. That doesn't make sense. But when my, when my mother-in-law, who's from Korea, makes kimchi, and I'm tasting her kimchi, and I'm cooking, and I'm like, oh, I think if I put like a little bit of her kimchi juice in my paella, or a little bit of kimchi juice in my sauce of matrashana, which is a total Italian dish, and then I mince up that kimchi, and I say, I'm going to add that instead at the end, instead of adding the crispy pancetta back for texture, and you eat it, and you're like, oh, this is like a matrashana, but it's different. It makes sense. So we just try to make sure that with everything we do has a reason. And what does your mother-in-law say about that dish <laughs> that she, she hasn't created? Tried, I don't know. She hasn't tried that one yet. <laughs> she hasn't tried that one. Okay. But she lo- she's my biggest fan. So I think that, uh, yeah. She, Good for uh, you. She loves all, everything that I make. So I, luckily, it, she, she that likes way. me enough still that she, uh, yeah, I haven't messed up yet. So I okay, can do great. no wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So you have created so many dishes, how you keep track of what you are doing. And then I, at the same time, I'm interested about, do you have a favorite dish that you have created? I think one of my favorite dishes that we've ever made is the sea urchin carbonara at, at uh, Copa. And it's a very traditional carbonara recipe that I learned working for Billy Grant, uh, that he learned from his grandmother an Italian restaurant in West Hartford, Connecticut when I was a kid. And the addition of adding like fresh, beautiful New England sea urchin at the end that's like acidic and pungent and fishy really was just wonderful. And we did it on a whim right when we were opening. And that dish is one of the dishes that has never left, never left the menu. So thinking about like the, the chef that might, you know, listen to, um, to the show here, What would be your main advice on how they could maybe looking at expanding their business? Like like anything, when you're expanding your business, make sure you know why you're doing it. If you're just doing it for the money, you're not going to be successful. If you're excited because you want to be in a new market, you want to be there, that's a great reason. And my biggest my biggest advice is don't open up a restaurant or do a business in a city that you wouldn't be willing to live in. Thinking about like the different ingredients that you have worked with and zillions, I guess, what what ingredients are irreplaceable to you and why? Garlic. I think garlic is, I can do, you can do a lot with garlic. Garlic is used in so many different cuisines and cultures. 
and it adds such a unique flavor. I don't think I could ever substitute anything for garlic, personally. People say salt, but I can always, like, I, I actually haven't had any kosher salt in my apartment in, like, a week because I keep forgetting to buy it when I go to the store. So every time I cook, I'm like, oh, shit, I don't have any salt. So I use fish sauce or garum, and I, I've been getting by just fine. So I say, you know, people should just be aware of their palate. But I could, yeah, garlic for me and black pepper. I think fresh black pepper in, in, in food, whether it's salad, a pasta, a rice dish on top of a raw fish dish, it adds such a unique flavor as well. And then what are like the new and unique maybe and familiar ingredients uh, that you are exploring at the moment? Any interesting, maybe new food that you are obsessed with? I love Indian food and I love Middle Eastern food. And I, it's been going back and forth to uh, Dubai over the years that I finally realized that you can get so like people think of green cardamom as one spice, but it's not. There are so many different levels of it with different intensities and different flavors that I've been, I've been experimenting a lot with uh, different kinds of green cardamom that I've bought, brought back. Whether it's in my coffee, tea, or in a doll or a vinaigrette, it's, uh, I'm just really fascinated by the, how it can be so floral. Is it, when you say there's different profile and so on, can you tell us more about this? Is it about like different terroir or is it different varieties or is it different stage of maturity or what, what is that? The way that I've found it graded the most is the way they talk about it in the markets is on quality. So the different size and the color and the aromatic is all graded on, uh, is graded from that, from quality. But I'm trying to find, uh, as I'm doing more and more research and uh, talking to people who cook with it and, you know, people who are from, from places where cardamom grows to find out why that is. So we'll have to do that on the follow up podcast because I don't know the answer yet, but I'm, I'm going <laughs> to find out. Okay, cool. Can you describe to me a little bit your, your creative process? What's, what's the first step? Where do you start? I find, you know, Ken actually gave me this advice when I was younger, and it has gotten me through every writer's block, so to speak, as a chef that I've ever had. To be creative, you're going to find your inspiration from a lot of different places. It could be from a song. It could be from an article that you're reading, a cookbook that you're looking at, a dinner that you've had. And opening up your mind to realize when something strikes you, to try to remember it and do something with it is important. But for me, I find that the best creative outlet for me is to just start cooking. Don't overthink it. Sitting in front of a notebook and writing things down is great, but I will have more impact with things if I just put me in a kitchen, give me a bunch of ingredients and say, start cooking. I become way more creative than I would be if I was just looking through recipes and reading books and looking at pictures and, and my notes from travel. So you are in that kitchen and you have all those ingredients. So again, what's, how do you start? What's the first step? Well, I look to see what I, well, it depends on what I'm cooking for. But if I'm cooking just for like me, and if you were over right now and I was just going to cook for yep. us, I would open up my fridge and just say, okay, what do I want? What do I want to eat right now? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's still the morning. Do I want to eat? You know, for me, I always love to have something with rice. I think about that and I just start just start putting things together until it, I come up with something. I would probably just keep cooking. You were talking about inspiration come, can come from a song. So do you, do you have an example of something that you have created based on, you know, based on a song? Well, I play music. So for me, when I say it comes from a song, I think in my opinion, everybody should find something that they do in life that's not just their work and their love that can help them clear their mind. Whether it's meditation, yoga, going to the gym, crossword puzzles, you know, things like that that can kind of help you empty your brain space, but still occupy your brain space with something else. I'm a big time meditator and I've been playing music my whole life. I'm still very, very bad at it, which is why I'm a chef, but I still love to play. So for me to sit down with a guitar or with a, I play bass mostly, to sit down with a bass and put, you know, put some, a, a song on listen to it, then turn off my stereo and start playing. I will sometimes just be playing, my hands will be moving, I'll be thinking of the song, and then my mind will wander. And as it wanders, I think of, if I'm playing a Led Zeppelin song, I can start thinking and wander, like wandering about where they were when they wrote the song and what, what the lyrics are on the song. And all of a sudden, I start thinking like, why am I thinking about Vikings? 
why am I thinking about Salcott? And then all of a sudden I'm, I put my, my guitar down and I'm on the computer looking up what, what people, what the Vikings were eating and, you know, how they were sustaining themselves and going, Oh, wow, that's a really cool thing. Let's do that. And next thing you know, I'm calling my friend in Iceland going, Hey, can you get me any of that fermented shark? Can you send me any of that? Because that's something that I all of a sudden came to. But I don't know that that's very typical for other people. That's one of the ways I go through it or listening to a, a jazz record and hearing somebody talk about food. Cause you, you know, Blossom Deary, an old jazz crooner from the fifties, she talks about food. Action Bronson, who I find that I consider Action Bronson, though he's hip hop, he still has a lot of jazz in his soul and the way he talks and, and he raps as an, as a modern hip hop artist, but he also used to be a chef. So hearing him talk about things and he, you know, in one of his lyrics, he says olives from Tunisia right after he references duck prosciutto. And it's like, oh, you know, that'll get my mind going. Duck prosciutto and olives together. Yeah, that might, that might work. And I just love that. I love just, you know, finding food, food references everywhere in the world. Do you think that's the, your creative process, you know, like uh, obviously evolve over time, but does it get it easier or, or more difficult? You know, I think for me, my creative process comes in, in cycles. I definitely get to points where I feel very stagnant and unmotivated and get beaten down. You know, if you're running businesses, you'll have days where as a chef, I won't step a foot into the kitchen with Chef Weiss or a knife because I spent the whole day doing the P&L review or meeting with HR or helping somebody do a schedule or doing peer-to-peer -peer reviews with, with some of the under chefs. And, you know, those are, after a week of that kind of, those kinds of meetings, it's, yeah, it feels really like you get low. So I need to revitalize that creative, that creative process. And that's when I just go back to the, what I said before, what Ken taught me. Just start cooking. Even if it's just walking onto the line at brunch, I was at expediting brunch yesterday and I was feeling like I hadn't cooked in, a, in, like in the restaurant in a while. And I just went behind the line when somebody was uh, in the bathroom and started cooking the egg station for a while. And I was like, hey, why don't you expedite? I'll cook the egg station. And by the time we were done, I was like, hey, I want to run this egg special next week. I have no idea why making eggs made me think of making something else, but it did. And it was awesome. And hopefully, hopefully it helps. So I would like to pick up your brain. Oh, I can hear that you are um, like uh, playing the guitar here at the moment. <laughs> uh, I, picked it, so, I picked it up when I said it. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to pick up your brain. I always ask my guests for a suggestion, thinking about, you know, home cooks, foodies that are listening. You and I, we talked about maybe focusing on tortilla española, and maybe you could suggest like a unique spin you know, to make it maybe like a Toro style or a little donkey style? Sure, sure. So I don't know if this is Toro style or a little donkey style. And this is something that I've done before. So I oh, don't Jamie know. Oh, Jamie Bissonnette style, you know. Yeah, this is definitely, <laughs> this is definitely my style. So I always have eggs in the house. They're one of my favorite foods. I don't always have potato chips in the house because I eat them too much. But you can get potato chips. If you live in a city, you can get potato chips within three blocks, pretty much anywhere in any city you live in, whether it's a bodega store or a gas station, whatever. So my, one of my favorite tortillas to make is I make tortilla española, but instead of using potatoes cooked in olive oil and onions, I use some sort of either just regular straight up salted potato chips, sometimes salt and vinegar potato chips. Barbecue potato chips do not work. Don't try that at home. They taste terrible. And I make a tortilla where I add the, I add to the eggs, uh, some potato chips in the beginning. And then I, when I, before I do my first flip, I add more potato chips. So it gets the bottom side on the first flip, gets a nice, like very, very, like golden brown crust from the chips that you can slide it right back. If it, you use an individual pack of potato chips and you only use three or four eggs, you can slide it right back into the, the potato chip bag and you've got tortilla española on the go. It's one of those. <laughs> really cool. And do you add any uh, kind of spices? I'm guessing it's maybe in the mood of the moment, but uh, yeah, it's you know, moment, but for me, tortilla española is best with potatoes, salt, pepper, and just good eggs. You're not adding the onion then? Well, this one, no, I don't usually add onion, but I, <laughs> my favorite one is to get the sour cream and onion potato chips. <laughs> so you've got the okay. onion flavor from that. One of my favorite little kitchen hacks at home 
is I always have garlic powder and onion powder. I don't use them every day. But sometimes when you're making something where you don't, you don't want to actually have chunks of onion in something or chunks of garlic or you don't want to cook the garlic out, but you want a little bit of that flavor, adding a couple teaspoons of garlic powder and onion powder here and there is great. Wow. My only suggestion is make your own. Making yeah. onion and garlic powder is super easy. Get a dehydrator, dehydrate your onion and garlic and pulverize it. And and what's the 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 ratio between like the the chips and the uh, and the eggs? Do you, do you have an idea? Roughly? Roughly I would do like one individual like I guess like a, probably like a six ounce bag of potato chips to four eggs. But you also have to take into account that while you're doing this, you are 100% going to eat some of the chips. So it's more like open up a six ounce bag and you use four ounces of potato chips, I think, in the actual tortilla. And the other two ounces of potato chips get eaten while you're cooking. Okay. Can I put some uni in there? <laughs> of I love course uni. you can. <laughs> I, make, I actually made tortilla the other day at home. I, I, I have a cabinet of all conservas that I bring back from Spain and Portugal and France. So I've got, you know, canned tuna and mackerel and baby sardines and canned, canned tuna in tortilla española is really good, but canned, like soaked salt cod, salt cod tortilla española with potato chips. My blood pressure might go through the roof if I eat that every day, but <laughs> True. my gosh, is it good. Did I read something correct that, that you were a former vegetarian? Is it correct? Yeah. Before, yeah. long time ago? Long time ago, I was. What happened? Because <laughs> obviously, there's a lot of meat in, uh, you know, all your menus and what you like. And, and you wrote like a book about it, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's ironic. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was, I grew up in a, in a music scene called hardcore punk rock. I was vegetarian, as a lot of our, a lot of people were. And we had like a, we had a big focus on clean living. So I was vegetarian. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I didn't do any drugs. I stayed relatively healthy. I did martial arts. I worked out, played in bands, and that was a very big part of my life. But when I went to culinary school, it started to like dwindle away. I learned from my love of food by being a vegetarian and touring with punk bands because there wasn't a lot for us to eat. And we would end up at Indian restaurants or Krishna temples, and I fell in love with the food. So oh, wow. eventually, I decided I wanted to be a chef. So at 17 years old and a young vegetarian, I went to culinary school. and. While I was in school, I stopped. I was vegan. I stopped being vegan shortly after I started school and I was tasting things. I graduated still as a vegetarian, but I would cook meat and, eat and like taste things and spit it out. And uh, eventually, when I was working in a restaurant, the chef was like, You're not going to be any better if you don't start eating what you're cooking, or you <laughs> should stop cooking these things and you should just like go work at like a, a vegetable focused restaurant. And uh, I listened started eating things, gained about 75 pounds in a month and uh, became an omnivore and I never looked back. Otherwise, you would never had uh, the chance to appreciate the hamon, yeah, serrano right. or, you know, from... <laughs> I'm a firm believer yeah. that if I was a vegetarian, I would still eat, I would still eat hubugo. Yeah. And you said anyhow that in Spain, even, you know, even for vegetarian doesn't count, so... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that's true, but that's how it feels. Yeah, okay. So uh, let me thank you. I'm looking at the time. I just want to make sure that uh, I'm respectful of, of yours. So I would like to finish with um, a series of rapid fire questions, if it's okay with you. Perfect. Okay. So you and I are going to, let's say, maybe Spain. So I don't know where you want to go. I don't know if it's uh, Madrid or Barcelona or San Sebastian. And so pick one. And uh, I just want to know where you are going to take me. And uh, maybe like if you have like three or four spots, you know, that um, you say, hey, Emmanuel, you have to try that. All right. So we get into San Sebastian on the train. We're going to walk from the train into Old Town, drop off our bags somewhere, hopefully. And the first thing we're going to do in the morning is try to put our name on the, on the list at Bar Nestor to get Tortilla Española. Hopefully we will. And they'll say, okay, yeah, you're on the list. And then we'll, we'll meander somewhere else to eat until we can go back. Immediately, we're going to go into Ganbara. Um, in Old Town, and we're going to get mushrooms, and if they have it, black truffles and eggs, and these little sandwiches of mini croissants with jamón iberico, and probably some carabineros, a couple glasses of cider, and then we'll walk uh, walk around the corner and maybe go over to 
Cuchara San Telmo, the spoon of San Sebastian, to get the foie gras, the veal cheeks. For sure, they have the best morcia I've ever had. Oh, boy, um, I love that. <laughs> and then we'll walk back down into Old Town and get go to Bordaberry. And there at Bordaberry, we'll get the orzo risotto with the Isabel cheese. And then maybe take a step uh, around the corner and go over to Chepecha. And for dessert, before we have our tortilla, we'll have some anchovy toasts. Nice. Any bar that we can end up at? All of those places we'll be drinking either chocolate cider or, or something like that. But at the end, we'll walk over to, uh, to Gross Side by Zuri Beach, and we'll head over to the Gin Toneria and have some, some awesome inventive gin tonics. That's great. That sounds fantastic. Uh, we have to look at our uh, respective agenda here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking about music, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious. What genre of music do you listen in the kitchen? Uh, in the kitchen, we don't listen to a ton of music during service, none. But during prep, I let everybody else pick until somebody puts on like reggaeton and then I take over and I put on jazz. Okay. Can you name like uh, interest, like new three, maybe chefs in uh, Boston and in, oh, Boston, sorry, in the New York area that um, we all should try? In Boston, I say, I mean, he's not that new because he just won the James Beard Award, but I don't think enough people know who he is. Tony Messina at Uni. He is just fantastic. I love the food that Colin Lynch is doing at Bar Mazana and Black Lamb. And lastly for Boston, Dave Bazigan. He's an old school Boston guy. He lived in San Francisco for about a decade. And he's been back in Boston now for a couple of years. He has Bambara. And he is just a, a force to be reckoned with in the kitchen. Any, anyone in New York? I still love what the boys are doing at Wild Air and Contra, Jeremiah and Fabs. Those are two of my favorite young guys in Boston, in uh, New York City. I love going to their restaurants. Okay, cool. Do you have uh, three cookbooks that you can talk about that have most influenced you in your career? Absolutely. La Technique by Jacques Papin is my favorite cookbook of all time, followed closely by Mincer Cooking by Michel Girard. I think that's just a, a wonderful book. And the Thai Street Food book uh, by Dave Thompson. I think the last one. So what's your next international travel destination for food, obviously? My next trip should hopefully be for our honeymoon. We want to go to Korea, South Korea, to yeah, visit exciting. Song's yeah. family, and then Japan. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Chef. I really, um, really enjoy having you, you know, on the show. We have been talking about it. Busy schedule, obviously. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, we found the time. Thank you so Me much. Too. Thank you. Have a great time in, uh, in Hawaii. Thank you. If you like my conversation with Chef Jimmy Bissonnette, please share it with your friends or colleagues, as I always welcome new listeners to the show. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, as you don't want to miss any upcoming episode. As a reminder, you can find all the show notes on the website flavorsunknown.com. Be sure to join me in two weeks with my new guest, Chef Brad Miller from LA. This is going to be a very exciting episode, as I have a lot to talk with my guest. He is a fine dining chef with his restaurant near Malibu. We are going to talk as well about his youth working at his father butcher shop in Illinois. He was part of the third season of the Hell's Kitchen TV show with Gordon Ramsay, and he has his own TV show on cooking channel called Food Track Nation. I see you in two weeks, and until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. Thanks for listening to Flavors Unknown. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a review. Find the show notes at flavorsunknown.com. And if you want to join the Flavors Unknown community, search Flavors Unknown on Instagram and Twitter.